Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for braving the cold and snow coming out. I uh, appreciate that you have an interest in what we're going to present tonight. Um, first thing, of course, silence your cell phones. That's what needs to be done, as they do in the movies all the time. Um, I'm Robert Grant. I'm the president of Free Thought Fort Wayne. And my partner in tonight's presentation is Chris Rex, who is vice president. And he's the IT guy that knows how to make this stuff work. Right? Sometimes. Okay. Um, those of you who are new here, I welcome you. Um, on the table in the back there by the by the uh, door where you came in, we have some brochures. You're welcome to take them if you're interested in any or all. Um, our business card is back there also, which you which you feel free to take one of those. It has uh, our website um, address, Facebook, and. Uh, a number of other ways to stay in contact with us. And if you'd like um, to leave some contact information, we just published our first volume one, issue number one of our newsletter, which we'll be sending out by email. So if you would be, if you'd like to stay and uh, have contact with us through that, um, please leave. Uh, your uh, your uh, email, if, if you wish, and uh, we'll, we will certainly include you in uh, in sending out our email. Um, the uh, new the uh, website, by the way, uh, is all uh, 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 rather the newsletter is, has our calendar, so you'll see some upcoming events as they become firmed up. Um, I left a copy of the full. Humanist Manifesto 3 for each of you. And there's an index card there if anybody has any questions or comments after the presentation. Uh, feel free to jot down a few thoughts. And uh, after we uh, work through the presentation, we'd be uh, happy to uh, answer any of your queries. Um, our presentation is uh, the guiding principles of secular humanism as espoused by the American uh, Humanist Association. Free Thought Fort Wayne, by the way, is a chapter of the American Humanist Association. Um, whether this is a review for you or, or brand new, um, I hope you find it both instructive and inspirational. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Chris, and he'll start um, running through our what do you call it? PowerPoint presentation. PowerPoint mm -hmm. presentation, and uh, we'll go from there. There'll be um, occasionally some comments that. I'd be interested in making, and but uh, Chris is going to do most of this. So, uh, by the way, just two things. Manifesto is a perfectly good word. It's been somewhat tarnished by its previous use by communists and and others. Uh, but it means simply a public declar declaration of principles, policies, or intentions. That's the dictionary definition of it. And we'll go from there. All right, so how I have this set up is kind of an outline that we can kind of discuss a few things along the way. So by no means am I trying to make this a formal PowerPoint. I'm just putting a lot of things up on the screen. Uh, to help outline what we're talking about and keep track of where we're at and to honestly give you something to look at other than me. Uh, oh yeah, the first thing I wanted to mention here was this symbol that I put up on the first slide. I felt like that was most appropriate to start off this particular discussion. Um, 
that is what we call the happy humanist. Okay, so kind of the whole point of this presentation is to talk about humanism, and so why not have the symbol, or one of the main symbols that are used for humanism, uh, displayed up on here to represent that. Um, so I, I thought it was a really uh, quirky little symbol when I first uh, uh, saw it, so to speak. Um, but it's, it's growing on me over time, because you can imagine somebody happy and kind of going, yay, I, I don't know. <laughs> so there's the happy humanist. So we have to first start out with what is humanism from a very basic perspective, right? We have to start off defining it, and then kind of describe what a humanist is, which is actually the easiest part of the entire presentation. Uh, then we have to talk about the life stance, like what does... A humanist do? What do they value? These kinds of things. And then we have to kind of talk about what started it all as far as what uh, you guys have on the table right in front of you, the Humanist Manifesto. That's typically what we consider to be one of the starting points for a firm framework um, from which humanists derive their sets of values and aspirations. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, um, a little bit of its history, because this is actually a 2003 rendition that you have before you. There were a few other editions before that, and so we will briefly uh, just discuss those as well. But as far as what you have in front of you, it can really be broken down into seven major topics. And so we're going to address each one of those topics and go through them. Now obviously, this is not supposed to be treated as a Bible by any means. Okay, this is really supposed to be meant as a framework to build your life off of. Um, and honestly, you know what? If you just want to pick and choose some things from it, that's okay. All right? That is one of the things that makes us a little different from something like the Bible, which explicitly states within it, you cannot pick and choose from this book. You either follow all of it or you follow none of it. That is explicitly stated in the Bible many, many times. That is not explicitly stated in this. Okay. So there's a little bit more leeway, so to speak, with the manifesto than uh, with other religious texts, so to speak. Uh, and then we're going to allow some time at the end here for questions. If you want to clarify something or have us go over one of the other themes again, or honestly just ask us if we really eat babies for breakfast. You can ask those questions. And the answer is no. All right, so to start with, I wanted to talk about where we've come from. Okay, the first version of the Humanist Manifesto was started in 1933. So a little bit of time uh, before the Second World War was really when we started putting together this framework. And the, the main organization that was really behind putting this together and giving it a real, I don't know, real physical sense of existence was the American Humanist Association. And they've really kind of taken over uh, the production and updating of the Humanist Manifesto over time since that date. So um, that's, uh, that's pretty incredible, over, over 80 years um, that this has been around. So not exactly new, but every few decades it did get updated. Okay, it was updated in 1973, and then of course I mentioned earlier that it was updated uh, 15 years ago. So, probably another 15 years and we'll see a slight other uh, update as well. But the whole purpose of this is really centered around what humanism is. Okay, if we think about what humanism is, it is properly defined here. I'm just going to kind of briefly read this for you. Um, I understand that you can read it, but we're really going to kind of talk about a lot of these principles. So, just briefly, it's a progressive philosophy of life that, without supernaturalism, affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good of humanity. Flowers and rainbows and awesome, right? The key, one of the key points in that, though, one of the things that really defines humanism is the fact that we are saying without supernaturalism. That is one of the key tenets. So that is probably one of the parts that generates the most conflict when it comes to others understanding humanism or what a humanist is and what we do and what we believe in. Now, I believe 
Bob wanted to add a little bit. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, if you notice, progressive is not capitalized. It's not a, it's not a political movement. Um, it really means the uh, progressive in this case is, again, a dictionary definition is promoting or favoring progress toward better conditions. So it really says that humanists tend to be open-minded. They look at the, the conditions that exist in uh, wherever they live and to see whether it meets the, the criteria that we will describe later on uh, to uh, create good lives for as many people as possible. So it's not necessarily political can be translated into political action, as it probably has to be if you're trying to change things that can be changed that way. But uh, we are uh, we're nonpartisan, and so we don't necessarily back particular candidates, but we certainly can uh, espouse uh, policies that we think will make life better. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so, just to follow from that, a humanist is just a person who subscribes to at least some of these ideas uh, that defines humanism. Oops. So, as far as the life stance is concerned, what do humanists do? Well, they tend to be people who are guided by reason, as opposed to emotion or instinct. Okay, that's definitely one of the most important things I try to convey onto my students uh, just because of the fact that logic and reason is really one of the things that defines us as animals on this planet. Because we can stop and think. Because we have the ability to critically think and evaluate things. That's really what, kind of what we're talking about here in this first, uh, first bit. Now, given that, we also have to admit that you do need at least a little bit of emotion involved, a little bit of empathy, a little bit of compassion in order to really be considered a humanist. Because of the, the root word in that, human. We have to think about other humans that don't rhyme with ourselves. Now, along the way, in order to make the most informed decisions for our lives and for others, we really need to involve our experiences and others' experiences. In order to do that, we have to keep in mind that facts are important and that they need to be evaluated in a way that is scientifically sound. So one person's story is meaningful given that it's put in a larger context. Otherwise, it's just an anecdote. And so we have to keep in mind that informed by experience is something that is a touchy subject in some cases. Of course, along the way, we have to live life fully and in a way that, I don't know, kind of not only encourages our personal wellness, but also encourages the most satisfaction and happiness for those around us, as well as ourselves. And so we have to keep those things in mind, too, that we're not necessarily subscribing to an idea that's selfless, but we do have to keep ourselves and our health and well-being in mind, as well as that of others. And then, of course, along the way, we realize that the thoughts and feelings that we have today were not the thoughts and feelings that people had 100 years ago. Right? 100 years ago, there were a number of things that we have changed nowadays such as the fact that certain people can vote that didn't used to be able to vote. Right? Uh, some of those certain people are in this room. I believe that they're enjoying their right to vote uh, rather well. So we have to think about how our views now are still going to change from that of 30 years from now. And that we don't have the best things in mind right now. And that's why every 30 or 40 years, the Humanist Manifesto changes to reflect some of those adaptations to our line of thinking at the time. And it's that progressive change, always reaching farther 
always looking for something better that really kind of defines what humanism is at its core, which is to say it's about caring for humans. Which brings us, of course, to the, uh, the papers on your desk, the Humanist Manifesto, the third version. Uh, it's entitled Humanism and Its Aspirations. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of go through some of those points together and kind of discuss some of these primary themes. Now, I've broken them down and numbered them. All right, they're not numbered on your sheets. Uh, and basically, I've just kind of started off with the bolded sentence and then kind of listed some of the important subtopics beneath each. And so, uh, the first one here, we have the knowledge of the world is derived by observation, experimentation, and rational analysis. Needless to say, this is my favorite portion of the Humanist Manifesto. And it happens to be the first portion. I am a scientist, therefore I like doing things scientifically. And you'll note that that is the first sub-point right here, is that science really is the best way to derive new information, and to integrate and evaluate old information as well. That's why it pains me to see so many things nowadays that are trying to go a step back and roll back all these things that we've been doing uh, for over 100 years in some cases. We are becoming anti-scientific as a country, and that's harming us. And if there's ever a time that we need humanists, it's now, more than ever. So science is really one of those things that's near and dear to my heart, and that I will fight for and defend um, to my last breath. Science is how we are all here and alive, and not freezing to death in zero degree weather. Right? Science develops technology. Technology is what we use every single day. The other thing we have to keep in mind is that along with this first point, we're also talking about, well, you know, it's great to subscribe to something as organized as science, but we also have to recognize that there is value in things that aren't scientific. Needless to say, things that I don't understand very well. <laughs> which is why I got married to someone who did. <laughs> so my wife is the educator in that department. But it's great to have these, these other venues, you know, like art and entertainment, music, these other venues for outlets that provide not only raw entertainment for us, but also give us a more thorough sense of satisfaction from life and allow us to drone on for hours and hours in the lab as we're running an analysis. So we have music playing in the background. So we have to keep in mind that these things do have value. Uh, the second thing here that we have is humans are an integral part of nature and the result of unguided evolutionary change. Once again, kind of scientific, so also kind of my field. Uh, especially since my field is biology, it is awesome that they have this in the Humanist Manifesto. Evolution produces organisms through a random process called natural selection. This is important. Random processes resulted in us, not directed by anyone or anything. We are random. It happens. We can either accept it or we can latch on to other ideals which try to convey a sense of greater importance to our lives than other lives. And that's simply not true. Every single organism on this planet is special and unique and important. We are just one of the billions of life forms on this planet. And it's important for us to understand that. To understand that we're not greater than them or equal to them in every way. And we need to treat the world fairly and with respect in order to convey that message um, across the board. Mm. There was another sub-point on there that I kind of wanted to mention. Uh, it is important for us to welcome the future, not be afraid of it. Right? Some people ask me, well, what's the future evolution of mankind? I'm like, well, if we don't blow ourselves up, it'll be interesting, won't it? Because what we're seeing more and more is 
as time goes on, we are all blending together. We are all exchanging genetics between all different cultures and races and ethnicities. So the future of humans is to become one single race, one single type of human. Even though technically right now we're all the same type, races are kind of an artificial construct, aside from that rant, we are going towards the same exact endpoint. All of us. And the sooner we realize that, the sooner we can start focusing on important things instead of quibbling over who's got the lighter color of skin. Did you need to add anything to that? Not really, except uh, on the, uh, you don't have it listed there, but one of the uh, uh, points under the unguided evolutionary change, Chris, mm -hmm. was we accept our lives as all and ending up. Basically what that says to me, and I'm not sure if that's what exactly it meant, but um, it's carpe diem. Mm -hmm. We're not worried about an afterlife or anything else. Uh, so, um, uh, that's, that's basically it. We're not concerned about anything except what happens in the here and now. I thought that was important to point that out. I think one of the things that might add to that is just kind of maybe paraphrasing some of the things that some of the uh, astrophysicists have said about uh, us being star stuff and how magical and wonderful that thing is. Uh, the fact that when it comes to anything other than hydrogen and helium, you really need either a neutron star or a supernova to generate those, those types of chemicals. Okay? So basically any element in the world that's heavier than helium was generated in something magical and awesome that happens in the universe. And so we are the result of that. Because we have all sorts of heavy compounds in us, whether it's the iron that allows us to gather oxygen from the air, or whether we're talking about the oxygen itself. Those are all heavy things. And it's magical to think that when we die, we just give back to the universe what it was able to give us. And so I feel that that is just as, if not more, meaningful than some of the religious outcomes, whether they be heaven or hell, or some other thing in between. All right, the third point here that I wanted to cover was ethical values are derived from human need and interest as tested by experience. Once again, we see that word come up again, experience. But now we're talking about ethics. Ethics is a little tricky. It's something that I think is still evolving and something that might be subjective in some cases. Not a single one of us in here have the same notion of morals and ethics. We all have our own individual thoughts on that. And that's fine. But what we have to realize is at the core of it, at the end of the day, we really need to try to make decisions that are firmly grounded in human welfare, and looking after each other in a way that doesn't forget what else is out there, the environment around us, the other organisms that we share this planet with. We can't get lost in focusing on just us. Otherwise, we end up basically raping and pillaging this planet for everything it's worth, and then we have nothing left, and we will all die. So we have to keep in mind that it's a balance. The other thing to keep in mind is just to go back to my previous point. With race, every single person is worth some level of respect and dignity. Once again, no person is of greater worth than another. Did you have something to say on that? Yeah, I did. And, uh... By the way, I was reminded that with my low voice, it doesn't carry very well. So uh, I'll try to uh, use this thing. 
to get my point across, but I think one of the uh, important statements there is ground values in human welfare has extended to the global ex ecosystem and beyond. Um, I think that means that uh, we really need to understand that the horrors that are occurring around the world, either in war-torn places or places affected by climate change, uh, which is leading in some places to famine and starvation, um, we need to be concerned about that as well. So um, it's not just what happens here, but what happens all over the world and how we can affect that. Thank you, Chris. All right, the fourth point, life's fulfillment emerges from individual participation in the service of human ideals, or humane ideals. This one was a bit of a complex topic, so I tried to break it down into a few different bullet points in order to help guide us along the way, because that really kind of encompasses a lot of different things. And so, first and foremost, we have to think about, well, we need to be able to live life without some, or with some sense of purpose in it. That can be a little difficult without religion, because one of the primary things that religion does is give you some sort of purpose. And a lot of people take pleasure and comfort in that. One of the biggest things that we, we struggle with as humanists is to develop that sense of purpose. One of the things that I like to try to relay that to and make an analogy with, and my wife tells me I'm terrible at analogies, so I apologize because this is probably a terrible one too. Uh, but one of the things that I like to relate this to is the aspect of slavery. Once you free a slave, who is telling that slave what to do? Who is telling him where to wake up every morning? what job he should be doing every day, where he should live, who he should marry, how many kids he should have. Who's telling him those things if he's free? Does he really have no sense of purpose now? Or can he somehow generate his own sense of purpose from his own set of ideas and feelings and thoughts and emotions? That's the kind of thinking that we're trying to encourage here in humanism, is be able to take responsibility for generating your own path in life, generating your own sense of purpose. Even if there's just one person out there that you can look up to, that you can provide for, that you can make their life better, that's at least something to give you purpose in life. You had a question? If, if you don't mind, I, I just want to add one little thing to three and four. If you read between the lines, it is implied that humanists um, rally behind social justice issues and equality. And that brings a lot of humanists a lot of purpose in that they become what I would call warriors for equality and social justice. And as Chris had mentioned, that uh, we are kind of taking some backwards steps in some areas like science. We are also taking some backward steps in this nation when it comes to equality and social justice. And you will find um, there are some very, very active humanists across the United States that are working tirelessly to see to it that all people are treated with respect and dignity and that they have the same promises and access to things in this world that everybody should have. That brings me a lot of purpose. Uh, that is a very true point. Both me and my wife have been accused of being social justice warriors. So uh, consider that a, a badge of courage, if you will. <laughs> um, let me see. I don't know. Did you want to add something else to that? Life's fulfillment emerges from individual participation in the service of humane ideas. Um, Well, we talked about the fullest development of all. That's what we aim for. One thing that I found ironic, um, to some extent, so 
uh, in the statement that our lives are animated with a sense of purpose. Uh, the Army has adopted a motto, be all that you can be, which is a good motto. Uh, unfortunately, as far as the Army is concerned, it's uh, applied, unfortunately, in, in ways that we would prefer to uh, avoid if we possibly can. But that's basically what it means. Um, no, that's really all I had to say about that. All right, point five. Uh, humans are social by nature and find meaning in relationships. Which is to admit that humans are a group of primates. And primates, most of them, are pretty social. They, they travel in troops. They have hierarchies. They have some semblance of community. We have the same exact thing. Primate troops are governed by some set of morals and ethics, so are our communities. They have laws that, if broken, will render severe consequences, as do we. Once again, just reiterating, we are another animal. And as such, we have the capacity to do horrible things, be very cruel to each other, be very violent to each other. And we can also do wonderful things. We can give our lives for a mere stranger that we've never met before. And because of that, we are trying to work towards a world that's a little less X and a little more helping hand. Because of the fact that we recognize that our history has been la laden with war and with conflict, and we would like to work towards a future that doesn't have as much of that. Now what's nice is that just the natural progression of human society, we're seeing that happen right before our eyes. Countries around the world are having drops in violence and murder almost every single year. The downward trend is constant, and we're hoping to get to a point where we don't need the types of things that we have in place right now. We don't need to worry about horrible things like somebody walking into a movie theater or a concert and shooting it up. We're hoping to work towards a time and place where those things are not on our minds. So that's something that we really kind of value here and what we aspire towards. Uh, one of my favorite sayings, I guess, and I'm not sure if I invented it or not, but uh, we're plainly social. We manage to organize ourselves in ways that produce everything you see around you. Um, and my, <laughs> my saying is that if we had not done this, because we are not the fastest, the strongest, uh, have the greatest claws and teeth, we would have been somebody's lunch if we had learned to cooperate and work together as far as uh, developing through <coughs> evolution to the point where now we dominate the planet. Um, so our social aspect is extremely important. And one uh, thing that you, we in this country have to be careful about is we value uh, individual freedom a great deal. Um, it is uh, one of the uh, founding principles of American way of life. But we need to balance that with our social responsibility to one another. Somebody's individual freedom can also be taking freedom away from somebody else.
so we need to uh, work at uh, balancing uh, those two things out, individual freedom and our inter interdependence with one another. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, we, uh, and we inspire hope of attaining peace, justice, and opportunity for all through that cooperation. No, that touched on a great point. Uh, if I can just do one more on point five here. Just the fact that um, those who are incarcerated uh, tend to always want to be free. But in many cases, their being free puts other people's lives at risk of being robbed, being harmed, or whatever. And so that absolutely is something that we need to balance. And like I said, we're having to worry about that balance less and less over time. But we still have at least 100 years uh, of some good prison system activity, unfortunately. All right, point six, uh, working to benefit society maximizes individual happiness. This is one of the hardest things that people struggle with, that I struggle with. And honestly, that's one of the things that we have really improved, um, I feel, a lot on here as Fort Wayne, uh, as Free Thought Fort Wayne. The fact that we're trying to get out into the community and help others in order not only make the community better that we live in, but in so doing, make us happier uh, as individuals, knowing that we are helping by providing a solution as opposed to being part of the problem. I think that's one of the big things that we are trying to change here in Fort Wayne, uh, especially with the homeless population that we have. Um, with us doing the homeless gift bags, and with the haircuts for the homeless, and with um, handing out food at the Community Harvest Food Bank. I believe that those things are ways that we can be, be involved in the community to some degree in a beneficial kind of way. Now, some of the other more subtle points um, obviously, along the way, we're trying to do things that, I don't know, maybe not necessarily go towards socialism, but this is probably the most socialist-like point that we have on here. Okay. Um, now, once again, this is one of the things that people don't always look to when they go to follow the Humanist Manifesto, and that's fine, okay. because they're afraid of the socialist undertones. But I've been feeling the pain lately by not having a socialist type system as far as healthcare. I go in for one simple operation and I'm handed a $2,500 bill. That's after insurance. That's hard for me to do. And I would consider myself to have a decent job. And if I can't afford my own health care, I've had to cancel all my future appointments and say, you know what, if I die tomorrow, I guess it's just too bad because I can't afford to stay healthy. That's what this last point here is talking about. We're trying to support a just distribution of resources and the fruits of human effort to try to make sure that as many of us can be healthy and well as possible. Now, you can fight some aspects of that, and that's fine. But what we're currently doing in this country is we're trying to ensure that everyone gets a public education, K through 12, free, on the house. Of course, those funds are also providing me with a wage at the moment, because I'm a public school teacher. But we're also keeping in mind that a number of other services that we take advantage of are provided free of charge as a community type of effort to provide basic services that we feel are most important to every single individual regardless of their financial status or their age. And that's kind of what this last point is getting at. Well, I, I agree 100% with uh, the concern over 
um, whether or not people can uh, provide themselves through a well-paying job, enough income to live properly and well, raise a family, and do what you can uh, to ensure that your children do as well, if not better, than you're doing, as well as provide for um, the vicissitudes of life, which is illness, uh, accident, um, disaster of one sort or another. Um, it's what's dividing our country a great deal uh, in this day and age as to how best we can do that. Um, the term socialism is, has been beat up pretty badly. All it really means is that all of the citizens of this country band together and decide to ensure that all of us uh, have a particular service. And Chris mentioned about health care. A lot of people that are uh, attempting to uh, move our country in the direction of um, universal health care. Uh, other countries have done it. We're the richest country in the world. And so um, it would seem like we're behind the times on something like that. We already do that. I'm collecting Social Security. I'm also on Medicare. I worked all my life and paid into both of those systems. Um, there's some talk now about doing something different with them. So we have a very different outlook between conservatives who think that does damage to, to uh, our society as far as making people dependent, and, uh, and liberals who think that it should be a right. Somewhere in between, we have to understand that our economy, uh, producing goods and services of value, pays for all of that. So the issue there is, as in the last point there, support a just distribution of nature's resources and the fruits of human effort to ensure that as many as possible can enjoy a good life. That's what we're talking about. And so right now it's a raging argument. And I think we all need to be involved in one way or another, regardless of what point of view you take, as trying to live up to that particular point. Thanks, Chris. All right. The seventh point isn't necessarily a bolded point, uh, so I apologize for that. But it is the next to last paragraph, I believe, on your sheets. And we felt like the wording of that was so extraordinary that we would just put it up on the screen and kind of read it as it stands and maybe talk about a few of the things here. So the first point in that, or the first sentence in that paragraph was that humanists are concerned for the well-being of all, are committed to diversity, and respect those of differing yet humane views. A couple of important things there. One is diversity. Once again, trying to make sure that when people want to consider being a humanist, it doesn't matter what age, what sex, what gender, what race, what belief you hold. You are welcome at any and all of our meetings. Don't care. It doesn't matter. What does matter is what we actually hold as our personal beliefs. That is to say, that they are humane and that they are something that are centered around what's best for us and for those around us. That's really what's important. So if you come in and profess to uh, uh, like to uh, take up some of the old habits and uh, burn witches at the stake, well, I don't think you'll be uh, asked to come to another meeting again. 
uh, unless you uh, remedy those ways. Okay? We're looking for humane types of uh, behavior to uphold and add to the diversity of our group. Now, the other point here is a little lengthy, um, so I'm just going to read through this real quick. We work to uphold the equal enjoyment of human rights and civil liberties in an open, secular society and maintain it is a civic duty to participate in the democratic process and a planetary duty to protect nature's integrity, diversity, and beauty in a secure, sustainable manner. This is another thing we've been struggling with, trying to adapt activities of ours as humans that are sustainable. Right? So this push towards green energy and renewable energy sources, that's what's going to help us become more sustainable as living beings on this planet. Also, the tendency over time, as we have a more educated populace that is more free from some of the patriarchal or matriarchal societies, a more equal and balanced kind of society always generates people that have fewer offspring. Fewer people is what's really going to allow us to become sustainable on this planet. Otherwise, we risk becoming a disease, a perpetual disease on this planet. And we're going to make the planet so sick that it will make it unsuitable to our own survival. I think that's pretty important. Now, of course, the first part here kind of discussed um, trying to make sure that things are as democratic as possible. Once again, stressing that everybody is equal and that it's fair to have an equal voice amongst all of us. And one of the things that's a little unfair at the moment is as we were pointing out um, during the last election here, that a person in Wyoming has more voice than you do here in Indiana because of the Electoral College. That is not the most democratic thing ever. What's democratic is every single person having an equal voice. That's what democratic is. That's kind of what we're talking about here. Do you have something like that? No? Yeah. Okay. You said very well. First. All right. So last one, no. I would like to. Sure. I'd like to participate in this one because I find it a beautiful summation of all that went before. It's very uh, inspirational and, and moving. So, let me borrow the microphone. Thus engaged in the flow of life, we aspire to this vision with the informed conviction that humanity has the ability to progress towards the highest ideals. The responsibility for our lives and the kind of world in which we live is ours and ours alone. Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, that last paragraph was just kind of wrapping everything up, kind of talking about all of what humanism is and what, honestly, in a very, very short couple sentences there, what humanists should aspire to be and what we should do on a regular basis. That's really all we're talking about here in this last conclusion kind of paragraph. And I think the main point of it is really taking that responsibility, because so often it is easy to blame somebody else for something when really we need to learn to take responsibility for our own actions and give credit where credit is due and to not play the blame game when all we're doing is hunting ghosts. So I think that's part of the, uh, the most important part of that last bit there. Now, of course, the Humanist Manifesto, once again, is property of the AHA. So I've just kind of put that on the screen as well. And just to remind you that Free Thought Fort Wayne is a chapter of the AHA, one of only two chapters in, in the Indiana. State of Indiana. Is that correct? Yeah. One of only two chapters of the AHA in Indiana. Uh, then that makes us a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Chris, three chapters. One of three. Oh, there's three? Three. Yes. three. 
Oh, okay. Jasper is an affiliate and not a chapter, so is there a third one besides Jasper? Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, Jasper is not a chapter, it's an affiliate. Okay. Oh, okay. So there are only two chapters. And we were the first. Okay, we were the first. Yes, yes, yes. Very important. Uh, Fort Wayne's number one. All right. So uh, with our emblem, we will go ahead and take any questions uh, or clarifications or comments that you have. So thank you so much. Um, what you hear a lot with humanism and atheism is the response that both of those philosophies are just a religion in and of itself. How would the humanist respond to that? Well, I guess you'd have to look at the uh, definition of religion. The definition of religion is that um, it is a belief based on faith that there is a God or gods. So, technically speaking, we do not have that. And uh, throughout the presentation that uh, Chris just made, um, it was emphasized that um, we do not take into account supernaturalism. Um, we believe science and uh, reason, critical thinking, are the ways for the best ways for humans to advance. And I believe that we have a pretty strong moral uh, purpose. Uh, it was part of the preamble. Uh, we spoke about uh, we aspire to the greater good of humanity. Um, that's also been expressed by, I believe, Carl Sagan when he talked about our aim should be the flourishing of our species, which is well in keeping with uh, the theory of evolution. So um, I think we are flexible enough, open-minded enough, um, and willing to share ideas and thoughts with all sorts of different people, as opposed to uh, what is called organized religion, uh, that requires people to believe. In fact, um, under the life stance of humanism, um, it, uh, the foregoing points that we, we are making is not what we must believe, but a consensus of what we do believe, and that's subject to change. It's subject to change on the basis of new information and uh, and discoveries. In fact, I guess I don't want to get too far into it, but we're finding out an awful lot about how the brain works, and it does seem to indicate that a lot of behavior, both positive and negative, is, is uh, dependent upon how the brain works, how the brain chemicals work, and so forth. So uh, I would reject the, any statement that atheism and humanism our religion. It's a philosophy of life, progressive philosophy of life, and uh, a, a guide for how we should behave. And uh, beyond that, I would not, I would not go. Uh, just to add a little bit onto that, I feel like the uh, progressive part is really dependent on the subject to change part, which is to say, uh, it's okay to say, I don't know. And it's okay to say, I was wrong, honey. You were right. <laughs> that's, I think, one of the biggest tenets. I know that's comical, but honestly, that really is. Because the fact that in this kind of way of life, there are no bad questions, there are no wrong questions. You will not find that in religion. There are unquestionable questions that you cannot ask and that you are just told, eh, it's faith. Believe it. You will never get that when using science and when practicing humanism.
Any other questions? If not, uh, I will, uh, I'd like to go through. Chris already mentioned some of the things we do in a small way to try to bring um, some of these ideals into practice in our own community. Thank you, Chris. I keep forgetting. Um, we donate gift bags. Uh, we're trying to do it twice a year for the homeless. We compile uh, personal care products, um, sometimes some snacks. Uh, in the case of the one coming up on January 14th, um, we're um, including also, or working with, the Food Not Bombs people. It's called, uh, what is it, Scarf? Scarf Bombing. Scarf Bombing. Scarf bombing. So uh, to the extent that we can, some uh, warm, warmer clothing, hats and gloves and so forth that we can come up with. So we do that. Um, in the uh, summertime, we did have a uh, give free haircuts for the homeless as well. And uh, we volunteer at the Community Harvest Food Bank. We've also done some food collection as well to deliver to that place. Um, so those are the small things that we've been doing. Um, Karen? We also um, provide um, discussions or lectures. We bring the speakers like this for tonight, and it's always free to the public. So we're trying to provide an educational outlet to express our views. And we've been expanding into doing more environmental things. Um, the last two years, we uh, got in on the Great American Cleanup and were assigned to park in the area and went through and cleaned up along the river bank and at Mosier Park and closer to South Haven. And several of the humanists within our membership got very involved with the recent um, hearings by the Indiana Regulatory Commission because INM is, or AEP, whichever you want to call it, is wanting a rate hike and the sole purpose of their rate hike, if they get it, is to expand a coal burning plant in southern Indiana. And uh, many of us went to those hearings and protested that because that industry's own studies, AEP did their own feasibility studies and found out that it is cheaper for them to go solar and wind power, that even though their studies prove that, they still don't want to do it. They want to expand that coal plant and they want the, the citizens of the state to pay for being polluted, basically. And there were doctors there who told about how within a 50 mile radius of that plant that they see no less than 150 people die a year directly because of symptoms brought on by breathing the air from that coal burning plant. So, you know, there's things like that, that, you know, when we talk about having a sustainable environment and a sustainable planet, as Chris presented in that um, presentation, there are things like that that we can step up to the plate and do our, our bit to try and make this planet a, a better place, not only for humans, but for all organisms to live in. And we also meet Wednesdays at 6.30, usually at a different place to go eat. Six. Six? Yeah, I was about to get to that, Mike. Um, two regular things that we do is uh, meeting at the Old Crown Coffee Roasters on Sunday morning from 11 to 1. Um, we always try to set up tables with a sign to designate kind of who we are. And uh, we welcome anybody who wants to come and have a coffee and a conversation. And as Mike mentioned, uh, we have a kind of a traveling road show on Wednesday nights. We go out to dinner. Um, uh, one of our other members, Chris Woods, uh, arranges for that, and you can find the place, uh, designated place and time, on usually on Facebook. Um, I think are we trying? We're not putting that on our website yet, are we? On the calendar? No, I don't think yeah. so. Do we? Yeah, Wednesday, Sundays. Yeah, on the calendar on okay. the website. But we're also on meetup.com under Free Thought Fort Wayne. Okay. So, and also under, in, in uh, on meetup, uh, you should be able to uh, find that too if you're interested. Well, 
that's about it. As, uh, as you see, or probably can tell, mm -hmm. we're, we try to be both a, a, a social, educational, and a charitable organization. And uh, we're looking for ways to inform ourselves and anybody who's interested and to spread the word. And I hope that our presentation tonight um, shows you the value that secular humanism can bring to individuals and to the, the community, and eventually, hopefully, to the world. Uh, because, uh, as we pointed out, that, uh, we want this to spread, uh, the message to spread to uh, globally. Um, the, the divisiveness of religion and ideology is such that uh, it has pretty much proven that it's not going to allow us to arrive at the ideals expressed in the Humanist Manifesto. So we believe we have a mission, both for ourselves as individuals and for our country and the world. So, um, those of us, those of you who are new to this, if we would be very happy if you could join us whenever you can. And if you like what you see at some point in time, perhaps come become members and participate in our activities. Okay. To that end, there is a um, sign-up sheet in the back if you'd like us to contact you via email. Okay, with that then, I guess uh, there are no more questions or comments. Thank you all for coming, and uh, hope to see you all soon.